All right, thanks everybody. We are reconvening um, our Board of Regent meeting. Okay, okay. Sandra Haynes, or Chancellor Haynes, um, thank you for that really awesome 30 minutes. That was so great. And I think to your point, um, having not to just go visit the uh, Bioproduct Science and Engineering Laboratory, um, the work that they're doing there is so transformational on a global perspective and they just did a fabulous job so please say thank you again for us and des thanks for making that happen just it's really nice as a board to be able to get out and see what's happening on our campuses i actually did try to bring it here into the room but you know, yeah i can see where that'd be a little bit of a problem like that. <laughs> the good news is, is i won the prize and answered the question the right way <laughs> I, um, as Enrique said, um, I should have had Harrison sign it because he might, when he wins the Nobel Peace Prize, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you can say great. we knew him when. <laughs> okay, we are moving into um, our Finance Administration Committee, and I'm going to turn it over to Regent Shower to take us through the agenda. So our tour that we were just on, um, we were lighting things on fire, and this finance committee is going to be fire. really fun. Fire. 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 So I just want everybody in the right headspace. So um, I want to welcome you to the Finance and Administration Committee meeting. Uh, we are live over YouTube, and a link to the YouTube can be found on the Board of Regents website. Um, first up, I'd like to introduce our Chief Audit Executive, Heather Lopez, with our internal audit update. And um, while Heather is uh, joining us, I wanna just kind of add a little bit about in the time that I've spent on this committee. Um, Heather is so thoughtful in um, being proactive and helping to really bring on the board member uh, to understand kind of the audit plan and the updates on the audit. And there are multiple touch points with our external auditor. So um, from this table, I have those individual conversations with the external auditor by myself, and they ask some great questions. And um, it gives me an opportunity where they ask questions about how things are going. And um, I'm able to ask a couple of questions and I have the same time and space with Heather too. So um, it's another element of, I think, our president's transparency and openness to ensure that there's direct and clear lines of communication between the board and this particular um, significant and crucial function. So I appreciate all the work that you do for us, Heather. And now it's uh, for you to give us your right. regular report. Thank you. This is a mid-year report, so it'll be pretty brief just on the activities uh, at this point in the fiscal year. At the end of the year, we'll have summary of all of our um, audits and other activities in a little bit more detail. Uh, on this report in your package, there are three separate documents, um, all kind of rolled up in one. Uh, the first one is just a really high level uh, status report on where we are at the uh, in the audit plan. And then there's a document that I'll actually touch on first. Um, it's an entrance document from the state auditor's office. This is required communication from the state auditor's office. Um, when Regent Shower talks about the touch points with external audits, we are always having audits. Uh, um, there's no shortage of external audits, internal audits, and external audits uh, ongoing throughout the year, every year. And probably one of our uh, most frequent visitors is the state auditor's office uh, in Washington State. They are the auditor for uh, public accounts, um, and they do all kinds of different uh, activities at the university. They do engagements on um, single audit, which they're doing right now, uh, and that's an audit of federal programs. They do accountability audit at WSU. It's every two years, and um, that is what this document is touching on, is the accountability audit that's currently engaged. And they also do investigations, uh, in whistleblower investigations and fraud investigations and performance audits. We have not been party to a performance audit in the state of Washington for several years now. So just the accountability audit and the single audit and the other types. Uh, the accountability audit, real, um, real quickly on that document, is just giving you information on uh, about the state auditor's office, their authority, and um, what an accountability audit is. They are still really engaged. Um, they've been engaged for several months uh, with the full team. Uh, my office serves as liaison with the state auditor on all of their engagements. And um, 
it's almost done. So we'll hear at the next meeting in September how that audit went. Uh, and then they'll be starting up for the next two year accountability audit. Uh, we are also in the middle of the single audit, the audit of the federal programs. Um, that is usually every other year, but if there is a finding in a federal program, then they come back and do a full audit. And we are in our third um, year in a row. And uh, that one also has been uh, pretty engaged, pretty deep. It's on the student financial aid program. Uh, I would say that the finding in the last, the last two years of single audit, the findings have been in areas that are pretty much outside the control of the student financial services uh, team. Uh, even though the reason for the audit is the amount of spend on that program, um, there's a tremendous um, great group of people working in student financial aid, um, have great programs in place to ensure compliance. All of that's being audited as part of the single audit program. Uh, where we get the touch points on the findings are, are on areas that are outside of their area, um, but they keep uh, getting the audit because that's the big program, uh, the financial aid cluster. So, so that one is also in progress. Yes. Can I ask when you say outside of their areas, outside of WSU's No, control? outside of student financial aid. Yeah, there's inside a- Inside WSU's. Control. But inside WSU, yes. Yes. Uh, so it is a, a statewide audit and WSU is um, just one of the agencies that they're doing some testing. That one is also wrapping up. It has a end date. Um, they're supposed to be done March 31st. So we'll hear more. We don't have a separate notice on that one, even though there's still required communications. They are auditing on the single audit on behalf of the state. And so they um, issue that notice to OFM um, as to the, they for the final report. Uh, so that's that one handout. The other handout is a uh, final report on our Audit of Clery Act. I'll touch on that one in just a minute. Um, just some status in our office last time I met with you. Um, actually, the last two times I was communicating some struggles in filling positions in our office. We do have um, an auditor, IT auditor, coming on in next month. So finally, I uh, was su successful there. We are also um, trying to be a little bit creative in um, making sure that we can meet the high risk areas on the audit plan and other areas of risk. And I had mentioned uh, in September, uh, we had hired back our retired IT auditor he's on a contract basis and he's completing some of the activity on our audit plan and cybersecurity controls um, and developing a continuous audit test model. And uh, he's still working on that, but we're uh, full steam ahead on that project. And uh, we will be contracting out for other IT audits uh, here in the next couple of months. So we're trying to make sure that we're covering those uh, significant areas. And uh, this lists also some of the other areas that we haven't yet engaged. Part of that is because we don't have the staffing. Um, we have three audits that uh, are listed as not yet engaged, but the vendor management audit is going to be contracted out. So we'll still get that in um, to the audit. And the other two areas, we're trying to figure out how we'll get it in. Uh, with our staffing, we'll see how well uh, the onboarding goes with our new auditor. Uh, and that's on this piece, and then the audit report on Clary Act. Um, so that audit was on the audit plan since August. Uh, Clary Act is a, a federal requirement, and it's um, related to timely notifications uh, on campus safety and alerts about issues. Um, related to safety, and it was already on the audit plan. Um, we had already started in planning, and as was um, mentioned a little bit earlier, there were events on um, or nearby in uh, Pullman community. Um, so I don't want anybody to think we did that audit just because of the events um, that had happened. This was already in, in play. This audit really focused on the governance aspects of the program, especially moving into a system model. Um, how are we making sure that we're in compliance across the system, across the state? Uh, so we did have a, a few recommendations. Um, some of them were identified as high risk, um, meaning that they needed to be addressed sooner than later. And management has addressed at least the, the first recommendation um, has already been addressed in that designation of a system-wide uh, Clery Act coordinator. And I'm not sure if you saw the notice on that, but uh, Chief uh, Gary Jenkins at WSU Police Department is taking on that role. Uh, in addition to his current role. Uh, the other areas, there is a, a timeline for implementation on that. 
There's one aspect of the Clery Act that we didn't include in the scope of this particular audit, and that's related to classification and categorization of issues when they come up. Um, many years ago, there was an audit um, from outside from a federal agency, and they identified issues related to the categorization and classification of crimes and how they go into the system that the university uses, and then they roll up to a nationwide system. Um, they all need to be consistent and, and make sure that they're correct. Uh, there were a lot of improvements at that time at the university to make sure that they were done correctly and trainings were put in place. We did not pull it into the scope on this audit. We're going to put it in the risk pool for uh, when we do follow up and verify corrective action on the issues related to governance in this particular report. And that is my, my quick, I'm watching my time here. So uh, I will take any questions if you have any. Other questions for each other? What do you think, um, just as far as just an onboarding and ramp up process for your new auditor for IT, what's, a, what's your timeline there, Heather? Where do you see yourself maybe in 60, 90 days from now? Uh, her actual start date will be the in May. Okay. And it'll take about two months to get her fully on board. Okay. So in the meantime, the, the contract I'm hoping is going to be in suite on one of the IT audits. So we can get to that before the end of this later. Okay. Thank you. Any questions from our regents uh, zooming in? Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have our academic year 2023-2024 tuition rates. Our interim vice president for finance and administration, Matt Skinner, and executive director for budget planning and analysis, Kelly Westoff. Yes, and I should explain Kelly is zooming in today. Okay. She's been a bit under the weather this week, so she should be on Zoom to help answer questions if we need it. Our invited Vice Provost Kola to join us again because we have a segment on FAFSA during this portion as well. Great, thank you for having us. Good afternoon, Board of Regents. Thanks for the chance to be here. If I might, just as we get started, echo Regent Dickinson this morning. Really excited to have Leslie Brunelli, our incoming Executive Vice President, here with us today. It's been great working with her so far. We're learning a lot, and we can't wait for her to start full time in just a few weeks. Just a few weeks, Leslie. So it's coming this year. So that's great. So let's see. Um, Academic year 22, 20, 23, 24 tuition rates. Uh, appreciate uh, Vice President Ola being here with us today. We'd like to take a, a few minutes today to reflect on some of the themes and considerations we talked about at the board meeting in January. As you recall, this is our second of three board meetings and discussions on tuition rate setting. Really appreciated the dialogue we had with the board in January. We'll then move into uh, looking at undergraduate and graduate tuition rates and benchmark that against some peers. And then we'll look at new professional tuition rates, which is new information for the board this time, this meeting. And then we'll wrap up with a reminder of some of the rate setting authorities and next steps for the board. So we'll jump into this here. So I took a minute to think back of what I thought was a wonderful dialogue among the board in January on tuition rates. A few themes or major considerations kind of stood out from that discussion. We talked a lot about the importance of a quality student experience in everything we do. We talked a lot about affordability, some of the progress that's being made at the state level through the legislature, as well as activities happening at Washington State University that is improving affordability and access to residents of the state of Washington. We talked a lot about the importance of predictability, that as we approach tuition rate setting, trying to be predictable and modest and consistent so that students and their families can plan from year to year to get finish achieving their educational goals. And certainly we'll see that predictability in the rates that are being proposed today. And finally, we talked a little bit about the important role of tuition funds and financial sustainability for the university. So we'd like to jump in a little bit more on affordability. We have some new information and follow up to some of the questions that we had at the board meeting in January. Um, again, this slide, we'll jump through this quickly. These are some of the positive storylines of the improvements we've seen at WSU in the last few years on affordability. 
We actually touched on this um, earlier this morning, Regent Powell, you actually mentioned this same talking point, which I thought was so useful. We talked about the Washington College Grant Program. It's really interesting to see some of the benefits to residents in this state. So an example, a family of four with an income of $64,500 would be able, their student would be able to attend a public college tuition free because of the Washington State uh, Washington College Grant Program. And for middle income families, the benefits might be slightly less, but there still is availability. So for example, a family of four making up to $107,000 a year might still be eligible for some tuition assistance. So really a great opportunity to get more residents to the state attending Washington State University. Matt, can you go back just one slide? Yes. I there was some, that first one of the tuition rates are lower today. That, yeah, yep. that's those are some staggering, like really <clears throat> positive things again that from a you know messaging and marketing standpoint just you're graduating 50 percent of our kids that have are debt free that's a big deal so yeah and then the improvement of those and all those things over the last absolutely year, quite quite an opportunity to share that vision thank you you know one thing um, that you might just be aware of too as you talk about FAFSA is just as of today, at least in Eastern Washington, uh, the College Success Foundation and Anovia uh, Foundation, and then a group of us that have created a, a, a nonprofit called Launch Northwest, have just launched a massive FAFSA campaign. Massive FAFSA campaign. So um, we have moved, I think, from 48 to 42, which is not great, but we are moving in the right direction. And um, as I've shared before, in our branches where we are completing FAFSA, we have just completed another evening where we've done that in, in STCU branches. And for the first time in our period, we have 30 families come into one branch and complete FAFSA in one night. So you can see that awareness is helping. And so as there might be room for WSU to target some of these areas that we're doing this work. Great. Thank you. That's wonderful. That's a nice segue. I'm excited you. Maybe you'd like to talk a little bit, some highlights of what the issue is doing to assist with the past awareness. Absolutely. Let me let me start with the uh, state level data that you started with, Chair. Um, it's actually 41 oh, good. Uh, today. So uh, <laughs> not bad. Uh, you know, it, at times in the past, Washington might have occupied the bottom five. So to be sort of at 41 is a step up 9% increase over uh, last year this time, another <laughs> good metric. So now you're talking about of the 88,000 high school seniors in Washington today, um, perhaps 31,000 have completed a, a FAFSA. And uh, that's about 35%, I think. And uh, that's good. Uh, the best states in the country are well over 50%. The best state is at 62%. Um, to get there, you, we probably have to do things as a state. Uh, no one institution is going to move that needle that far that fast. So, But as a state, I think we're doing well. Now, uh, down to the specific at WSU. This is one of the few areas where enrollment management has to speak equally to current Cougs and future Cougs. We have to talk to our current students about completing the FAFSA again for the following year. And we also have to talk to future Cougs about completing the FAFSA for their first year. And we do it across the system. We use a number of uh, communication methods from uh, social media to email to phone calls. Uh, we, uh, it's done throughout the state. We collaborate as a state system. Uh, various student financial aid offices work with each other in their regions to do this. Uh, virtual events. Um, in fact, uh, in the slides uh, that Matt presented, there's a link that you can actually see sort of how we uh, schedule these things across the state. Um, financial Services also has a communication center dedicated only to financial aid questions, including how do I complete a FAFSA? Uh, we do workshops throughout the state, both at the high school and community college level. Um, and the beauty of FAFSA is we can talk to students regardless of campus because the FAFSA is a federal form. We can help any student regardless of the campus they plan to attend. Um, SFS or financial aid staff also attend all of our visitation programs throughout the state and on each of the campuses. So they're there to, specific, to answer specific questions of families and students. 
Um, and then finally, uh, just like we do with enrollment management in general, we do have individual appointments where we reach out to families and students and schedule separate appointments so that they can talk to us individually about their particular situation. It helps, it's about money. So often that is the best way to talk to them. Um, all of this sort of goes on um, year round. It's not even in cycle. We, um, SFS and financial aid and FAFSA information continues throughout the year. It's not actually con uh, confined to the cycle of admissions and enrollment. Um, those are my two slides. I'm going to stop here, and if there are any questions on FAFSA, I'll try to address them. Actually, my question is around the FAFSA uh, slash LAFSA. Yeah. <laughs> um, are if, if somebody completes the FAFSA, do they also have to do the Washington State version, like for the uh, college grant program, or this one? They don't have to do both. They don't have to do both. Some families choose to do the WASA versus the FAFSA, but, but they do not have to do both. But if they want to apply for a federal grant, they would have to yeah. do it. Okay. And the other question I have, um, I think all the assistance is really great, but there's a, there's a certain contingent of families I know in the Tri-Cities where um, it's basic. You know, the parents may not have much of an education, um, probably notice a lot of them didn't like, graduate from high school, much less go to college. And I don't know, I mean, what I'm worried about is, is that parents in those categories, I mean, doing the FAFSA or WAFSA might be just a, too big a step. And they, I mean, I, I, I understand it's simpler now, but when I did it for my youngest daughter, I thought, what a pain this thing is. And, you know, and I've been through college and graduate school, so I, I, could, I worry about that. And I don't know if there's what we can do about it. Well, there are there is some hope in the future here. There is a simplification that is moving through at the federal level. Um, it's likely to be delayed, so it, it won't appear in the next cycle. At least that's what we're hearing now. And actually, that delay is probably not such a bad thing because there are there are activities and processes that universities need to make sure aligned with the simplification that is coming through. Uh, but the, the issue of how do you help families who've never sent a child to college complete a FAFSA is real. It's one of the reasons why FAFSA applications typically are depressed in a community because families don't feel comfortable handing over financial aid or financial information. Um, it's also why the states that have the most increase and the ones that probably have the most or the highest uh, completion they have to invest in people on the ground helping families in those communities. It's, I don't want to say it's as simple as that, but that's the type of activity that increases FAFSA, is people helping families do this. Can you speak to just also that there are many schools in the country that actually will not allow you to apply unless you've completed FAFSA. Like, so like there are states that have these very high numbers, but they also require if you want to fill out an application, you have to have your FAFSA completed first. Yeah, most of the programs I'm aware of are typically a financial aid or scholarship program. So for example, um, eligibility over a scholarship, it's not merit, but they ask you to complete the FAFSA so that if there is any aid that you are uh, eligible for, they exhaust that before their program comes into play. And that's a, a very common uh, step that, that students are asked to do. At the state level, there are states that require the FAFSA as part of the graduation requirement at the high school level. Uh, that's a very, very um, interesting uh, approach. I think there are some states that have chosen that. Uh, I think there's a lot of work to be done in states that do that for how I just explained, that you can't just make it a requirement and things will change. You actually have to invest in having people help families complete the FAFSA regardless if it's a requirement for graduation. We just did an interesting, and this it speaks to what Dr. Taylor and others might have to, and, and the consideration or confirmation that we completed a, housing, a low income housing um, center in Spokane. We went through and did FAFSA completions for all those that could qualify there. 100% of every single student or potential student in that um, low, low income housing uh, facility 
qualified for 100% coverage. That was 11 seniors, and of the 11, only three families agreed that it would matter for them to go on to college. So the, the remainder, parents, had lots of other concerns right around well it's great that they can go to college but is there a value to that mm -hmm. and just the barrier then came down immediately so the financial barrier was taken away but there was a whole subset of barriers that become much more challenging and i think dr taylor mentioned that in terms of that community right and so <clears throat> i think um while it is not within our purview there are some real problems with the FAFSA form and the limitations to those that are houseless, that don't have a two parent or a one parent, and then don't check one of three boxes that get you exempt through the process. Um, it's very much built around a parent or double parent family that can fill out a form. And so I, I really appreciate this piece because this was an area that we were asking questions about in terms of, okay, we're on a, a path to continue to raise tuition. How are we also on a path to help our students and potential students to um, access as much aid as possible? And so you've been in, in this space with us you know, more than once today because it's just so important. And I think the work that you're doing speaks to that collaboration between um, many different divisions of WSC. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Lynn, to sneak that little follow-up in there. That felt like a good time to do that. Maybe to connect some dots to our last conversation on tuition. Then, as we talked about a rate increase for resident undergraduate students, we would expect to see that about a third of our students would be protected from that rate increase because of federal aid and the Washington State Washington College Grant Program. So, the other follow-up topic we had from January's meeting was to talk a bit more about tuition funds and its important role in the financial health and sustainability of the university. We pulled together just some really high-level slides that might help answer some of those questions from the last meeting. So we look at the university's budget. The total university has about $1.2 billion in revenues every year. About half of those revenues come with specific restrictions or designations. So, for example, a federal research grant, those come in as revenues. We have to use those funds specifically for the research grant that it's given for. That leaves us with about $600 million a year in what we've traditionally called a core operating budget that's used to fund our instruction, research, and service and operations at the university. So as we look within that pie chart, we see here the important role of tuition in that core funding set, making up about 41% of those total funds that support the activities of the university. Then combining that together with state funds, that number is about 90%. And that kind of explains some of the discussion we had last meeting about um, the legislature baking in the tuition rate as part of the state appropriation. We see how important those two elements are together, the state appropriations and tuition and operating the university's budget each year. But this slide might be of interest to the board as well, and I apologize. Those oh, look better up there than on my screen. The font looks a little small on these other screens. Um, as far as tuition, sources of tuition revenue, we see that um, 85% of tuition funds come from resident or from undergraduate students at WSU. And within that gray colored pie sliver there, about three fourths of that revenue comes from resident undergraduate students. About a quarter of that undergraduate tuition comes from non-resident students. So with that perspective on tuition as a funding source, how do we use tuition every year? This is how tuition is generally used as far as, as our uses. We use our tuition to pay for salaries, wages, and benefits for faculty, staff, hourly, and student hourly employees. That's where the bulk of those funds go every year. That kind of makes sense given that our instruction and service activities at the university are very um, dependent on our faculty and staff and hourly employees that make it all happen. Day. So fairly intense as far as our salary wage and benefit expense. So just some high level information about, again, the important role of tuition funds and how we use those to support faculty, staff, and student hourly employees. 
With that, let's jump in then to the undergraduate tuition rates. Again, a reminder of this slide, this is what's being proposed for both resident and non-resident undergraduate and graduate tuition at two and a half percent decrease as we discussed at the last meeting. We want to go into some benchmarking information here as well at the request of the board. So let's start with undergraduate resident tuition. A nice reminder on this slide, and Rachel Dixon, this goes to your comment. Here's that slide that rates are actually more affordable today than they were 10 years ago for undergraduate tuition. We also see at the right side of this chart that effort to bring more predictability and consistency to the rate setting process. A modest increase every year that can be more predictable for students as they plan for the cost of education year to year. As far as benchmarking, we benchmark this with the help of Chris Wade's group and in institutional research in two categories. We look at what we call the PAC-12 peer institutions, as well as the strategic planning peer group. I would note if you get really into the numbers on here, these numbers for Washington State University look slightly different than the rates proposed on the previous slide. For benchmarking purposes, we pick up all of the mandatory fees and include those in here to try to give a full benchmarking of our cost uh, versus other. Matt, would you say that's apples to apples? Do all these universities, is this their collective or do yeah, they have do. fees we, mailing out here we, and there? We do our best to collect the mandatory fees. Certainly each institution might have a slightly different approach right. for how they deal with those mandatory fees. Some institutions, um, put the fee on the student's account and say you can opt out in the first 10 days of enrollment. We, we don't do that. We just, we just make sure everybody knows it's, it's there. So there is a little bit of difference there, but I don't think it's materially different. We just think it's nice to make these are about valuable comparisons. Matt, I've got a question on that. Um, I remember reading an editorial um, by the uh, president of Purdue, if I'm remembering correctly, and they have a system and it's sort of like a, a tuition promise. So that if you come in as a freshman and you pay, you, you pay X, that when you graduate as a senior, you will only pay that tuition you know, for the same four years. And it is, it's for to, sort of to the, um, the whole thing about predictability of, what, of costs. So I just thought I'd throw that out there. Not, you know, given the, the charts you just showed us, that, that might put a real dent in, um, you know, some, some of the um, monies we need to run the university. But I just thought it was an interesting concept on uh, just the whole uh, affordability and predictability for the uh, family. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And that I think in the last decade, and Kirk and Elizabeth might have perspective on that. Well, has been fairly popular amongst other universities where they came up with those guaranteed tuition plans. It's been interesting to watch those evolve over time. Some universities are finding that then they have to create such big disparities between each tuition group because, from a financial perspective, they're probably building in five, four to six years of tuition increases into that rate that people pay up front. And so I think some universities are actually stepping away from those a little bit now and um, but trying to get into something Purdue, that's Purdue more predictable. Is, um, lower than we are. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, just, just, a, just a really thought. Good. That's really great. So um, again, we're just below, just below the average in the Pac-12 group and just slightly above the average against those strategic plan peers. Regent Shaw, let's keep moving through yep. those unless folks have questions on a particular group. Looking at non-resident undergraduate rates, uh, interesting here that we are um, among the lowest in the Pac-12 and then um, similar low as well as the strategic planning peers. I would say based on the conversation that Sites she shared this morning, that's a pretty good marketing position for us right now as we're seeing increased competition among states for non-resident students. So that's probably a good place for us to be. Yeah, if you have a large number, large percentage of out-of-state students, you can see why those numbers generate so much revenue. Some of the California schools are colleagues of Montlake, um, you know, if you're 30, 35% out of state, that gives you an opportunity yeah, at that rate. Yeah. Yeah, Which then begs the question, right, that I struggle with 
and thank you to Regent, we have to be really vigilant about as we're a state university intended to support our children, kids that go to school in the state of Washington. So I think some of, you know, we know we have partners that have, you know, been scrutinized a little bit around not thinking enough of their own uh, within the state. So we always kind of have to balance that too. Yeah, that's great, thank you. Um, looking to graduate tuition rates, again, I thought this might be useful. Um, and Regent Chilton can certainly speak to this. This is a helpful analysis of tuition rates. We also recognize, at least at Washington State University, many of our graduate students choose to come here because of an assistantship package that brings here and them there as part of their studies. And so certainly tuition rates is one consideration, perhaps of a, a broader set of considerations that they have when choosing. Um, near the top third in the strategic planning peers and just below the average for Pac-12 universities. Yeah. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I know that I asked you to explain this before, but it's so confusing to me. Um, for graduate students who have an assistantship paid by their department, I know that's not always the case, but it's usually the case. Um, when we raise tuition, the department basically is now just, it's the department that kind of bears the burden of our increased tuition on graduate students. Yeah, really great question. Thanks for that. Could you repeat that? Just explain that a little bit. So for example, I'm on a research assistantship paid by my department. Okay. Um, and that covers the cost of my tuition. My department pays my tuition. Okay. So when we raise the graduate student tuition, since most of us are on assistance <laughs> by our department, then the burden goes on the department for those raises, right? Yeah, a, a nuance here, and I'll see if I can connect this correctly. And I can also follow up in the case of a position funded on a research grant, the research grant actually pays the cost of the tuition. So when there's an increase in that tuition, the grant would pay the additional cost of that tuition uh, each semester. So, yes, so all the department from an outside group, if you were on more of a state funded, we would call it a graduate teaching or assistance type position, then we provide a waiver for that tuition. And that would be a revenue loss if I could use that term, that wouldn't fall on the department to pay for that waiver. We don't charge that directly to the department. Okay. Thank you for that question. That's a really good clarifying question. Um, it looks like Regent Shetler has his hand raised. I do. Thank you very much. Uh, and Matt, just a real quick question. So on UW and USC, the, the spread there, is that for obviously for different departments? Is that because of like medical school or something like that for the uh, resident graduate program? Yeah, I think that's correct that they have an array of different graduate programs that are not professional programs. There's a subtlety there, like we have grades for um, and I'm not sure where the camera is here, Regent Scheller, so I'll miss talk. <laughs> um, um, we have different rates for graduate and professional programs, and I think some of these schools have multiple graduate rates as well with the graduate structure. Thank you. And then uh, just finishing this up again, looking at non-resident graduate students, uh, very similar to what we saw for resident students as far as our benchmarking to peers. So again, I appreciate institutional research helping pull this information together and benchmarking data against peers. We'll next jump ahead and look at professional and self-sustaining tuition rates. This is new to the board. We did not have these rates when we met in January. So first time seeing this information. Also want to thank and recognize um, two of our deans that have joined via Zoom to answer any questions you might have specific to their um, rate proposals, Dean Coates and, and Dean Lee, appreciate them being here. So we're trying to follow those principles of predictability here with these programs as well. It's proposed for the Master of Nursing program, a 3% increase and a 3.5% increase for the medical degree. Again, trying to stay in that modest percent that's consistent from year to year to follow. I would highlight something that's a bit unusual with the doctor of pharmacy program. You'll see that we're actually proposing a decrease in the non-resident rate. There's been a lot of changes in the demand for pharmacy students in the last few years, particularly in the non-resident space. So I understand those students tend to come as a non-resident to the issue, complete one year of study, and then they become residents for the remainder of their time in the pharmacy program. 
So uh, the Dean has proposed a, a modest reduction there in that rate to see if that will help the demand challenges there in the program. We have Dean Lead here if there's additional questions about that change in particular. So Matt, do we have the doctor of nursing practice said yet? You're going to see that two slides. Great question. Thank you. That's perfect. I love that. <laughs> Matt, it, I, I know Mark's on here. I think it would be good for him to talk. There's some strategy behind this, and it's been very deliberative and probably not without some controversy. That would be great for Mark just to speak to not just what he's doing this year, but I think what he's interested in doing next year as well. So, Thank you, Kirk. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, so the strategy is that well, let me just say right now, we have in our first year class, five non-resident students. And the delta on that, I included fees in my analysis. So my non-resident tuition right now is 43 plus fees is 43,118. So the delta between resident and non-resident is uh, 17,270. And so my, my five students who are paying that right now that generates 86,350, which is about 3.3 residents. Uh, so the idea is to, to bring these folks in, try to, try to bring non-resident students in from Northern Idaho, Eastern Oregon, Nevada, and California um, to try to uh, build back our, our uh, student body to about 120 students per class. Right now we're at about half of that and that's reflective of the rest of the country as well. University of Washington, first time they haven't met enrollment targets in the history of the college. So, uh, so our idea, decrease non-resident tuition um, and then lure in students from out of state will never be more than uh, We'll, we'll always be uh, preferring residents and those will always be the majority of our students. But right now, as of last Friday, there are 144 Washington residents who've applied to pharmacy school. Between the University of Washington and us, we would take around 250 students per year. So there are not enough Washington residents to fill both of our classes. And so, this is the idea to go then outside the state and try to recruit some from our neighboring states. Nevada doesn't have a public pharmacy option, so they're attractive to us. And California just has a whole bunch of students, so they're attractive to us. And we've historically done well there. That's it. I'm glad you pulled that conversation out so that we could hear the strategy behind that. That, that was really helpful, thank you. Great. Wonderful. Thanks, Mark. And I think my little timer has just expired. Over I know there, it has. We will make it up later, I promise. I know. Shorter on the We're other. good. <laughs> um, and then inspired. as far as our self-sustaining programs, this are two pro the programs out of the Carson College of Business, the online MBA program and the EMBA program, proposing uh, some increases here at about 2.5%. This is a note there that this is the sixth tuition increase since the program started in 2008. So over 15 years, they've only adjusted tuition six times, which is which is pretty good for those programs. So social support there. And then um, here we are, region point can shift to the, Just as curious. you know, last board meeting, we approved the redesignation of the doc, the doctor of nursing practitioner program from a master graduate program to a professional program. And this would be the enabling and supporting tuition rate to support that change from professional program. The other highlight here is this would be effective for the 2024-25 academic year. So it gives a year of on-ramp time to change for students in the professional program. A topic for another day, but something I would love for us to dive into or discuss a little bit as you take a position like that with pharmacy um, students is, you know, really what could we be doing to incent students to be going into the clinical care of mental health? And since it's you're in such a crisis, what can WSU be doing to impact that and incent 
students who won't make any money because they'll come so far out of so far in debt when they get out and then we need them to do the work but their salaries don't marry to that so to me that's a discussion at some point we should be happy maybe a harvard grad i'd love to be part of that discussion. <laughs> Uh, friendly reminder to the board, the board has authority to set tuition for undergraduate resident students up to the threshold set by OFM every year, and then full authority to set tuition rates for non-resident and graduate and other programs each year. As far as next steps we have coming up, we'll be reaching out and engaging with students over the next month, including each dean for a professional program that's proposing a rate for meeting with students in those programs as well. We'll have all that back summarized ready for the board for May as you deliberate all of these rate changes as action. Before I open um, the conversation up for questions, I just want to thank you and the team for addressing all of the concerns and questions that um, the board had. This kind of three-step process on tuition <clears throat> setting has allowed for more of that dialogue. And I know that once you leave a board meeting, then the next conversation is how are we gonna get all this work done on top of the other work that we're doing and meet um, the questions that have been asked. And so I really appreciate that. There was one question that Regent McDonald um, addressed relative to price elasticity, that sensitivity pricing. And um, you're not seeing that in the presentation. It's a little bit more of a conversation about how to do that analysis. And so- I did um, have a staff member actually meet with me and we went over pricing and effect that has on students and different data she drew on. So Stephanie came. Oh, great. Did a great job of talking to me a little further about which things students react to when we change the price of it. Surprise tuition. Is not so much money. I can't get it. That's so fantastic. It, it was addressed directly. Well, okay, even good. better. So, because I've been kind so of. Matt's off the hook. Well, Stephanie, Stephanie just finessed it all. So, I mean, this, uh, again, this team is so impressive, but I had kind of the list of what the questions were asked um, from our last meeting and then showed up to my prep meeting and all of them were covered, except for the one that I will never forget. I, I got it personally. Right, and it's, <laughs> thank you. Well, I'm really glad. So it is good news and we'd love to follow up on that. It's such a unique, it's an important question and fairly sophisticated between all the variables. So I'd yeah. love to have a few more follow-ups on that actually to see what avenues there would be to get meaningful information. Right, it's a hard one that. to predict, even yeah. predict. Right. Yeah. yeah, there's so many factors that go into whether or not a student decides to commit after they've applied it or even apply. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's great. That's a great. So follow. well done to the, the team for helping to ensure that we were addressing the questions. Now I want to open it up for other questions that um, you may have. Uh, as Matt mentioned, we go into May where we'll take action. And so this is a good time if there is anything else that's lingering that gives you pause or keeps you up at night relative to this conversation, please feel free to, to ask. Anyone on the Regent Redmond or Regent Shuttler, maybe I'll start with you. Do either of you? Oh, I see. Heather. Okay. <laughs> An old fashioned hand, not yeah. the, the yellow <laughs> hand, but the old fashioned hand. Um, yeah, I was just two, two questions. One, I was curious whether there's anything that we are doing. We mentioned the, um, the, uh, the assistantship, I guess, you know, that we do on the graduate um, student side as it, it sounded, you know, all normal to me, but just anything that we might do that is different than some of our peer universities um, you were trying to do as much apples to apples, I know, and normalize everything as much as you could, but just if, if there's anything that um, we may be doing that's, that's either legacy or that we're doing as a matter of innovation that is helping us level the playing field um, at all. Uh, I was doing the math earlier when I, I forget who was talking about, uh, I think it was in, in student services when we were talking about the um, um, the programs available for uh, grocery credit and childcare credit. And I was doing the math on that. And I was like, okay, you know, 150 for groceries. And I think it was 400 for 
a child care, you know, per semester as, you know, I was like, okay, that, that adds up, you know, in the course of a, of a year as if you just kind of take that off of tuition, but is there, is there anything that we feel that we are doing that is out of the ordinary that maybe uh, other universities who are um, comparable to us or in our peer group aren't, are not doing that may make us um, better in some way or, or may make the, maybe the expense side look different than it than another university might look on the on the wages and salaries and benefits side? Yeah, that's a great question, Regent Redmond. If I could, we'd love to take that as a takeaway item yeah, um, to pull together. That's, we could cover a lot of ground on that question, really important. I would, in the materials, just point back to some of the positives there that um, the improvement we've had in the number of students that pay no tuition over the last 10 years, the number of students who pay full tuition is declining significantly, but the burden of debt load is declining significantly for students. Those are really positive. That what would be fun for us is to go back and look at some of the activities that are helping feed that improvement and do that as perhaps a presentation here back to the board at the right time. Yeah, and then the other thing I was curious about is when we, you know, so much of our budget is people, right? And so, you know, you, you showed that pie chart that showed salaries and, and um, uh, wages and then benefits, which are, you know, kind of a, a necessary um, part of that same picture. Um, and so, you know, if you take those two things together, they're basically the whole budget, which of course, you know, I think Elizabeth has, has uh, mentioned to us on many occasions and we all know that to be true. Um, just, I'd, I'd love to understand and, and benchmark us. And I think we've done this in the past, but just to keep doing it um, and maybe against trends as to how much of different kinds of um, people fall into um, or, or how we categorize different kinds of people in that pie. So that pie is sort of, you know, in, in, instructors tenure versus um, contract versus administrative, um, even people doing facilities work, you know, sort of the various pieces of that puzzle. And then you brought up another one today, which I hadn't thought about, which is students who are working for the institution and providing us with value, but also helping pay for their education at the same time, which is a, a neat sort of circle there. Um, and I'm, I was sort of curious, like, how, how much of that kind of uh, budget is, is kind of coming in one way and going out the other way um, in a, in, in, and how is that trending over time? Because of course those trends are really interesting too. So I don't wanna just heap more, you know, more data work on you, but I think um, those things would be interesting. And then I guess the other thing that would be interesting to me is associating um, particularly um, the, uh, you know, sort of the, the teaching and research um, bodies with the administrative support that those bodies require and whether we can look at some analogs in other industries and kind of see where we are there and benchmark that a little bit. Because there's one thing to benchmark ourselves against other academic institutions, but we also want to be innovative even as a um, as a uh, a whole um, field, we want to be innovative, and so we want to keep thinking about how do we put more dollars behind the the parts of the of the um, of the mission that are you know central to to what a land grant well, institution sure. does. Um, so I'd like to understand that a bit more too. Presidential. Yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, Regent Redmond. It turns out that we internally had some of these same questions asked recently by uh, a group of our regents professors. So we uh, just finished that letter literally this afternoon that's got a bunch of this data about how these different groups compare. How do we compare to peers like on a per student basis? So you have some normalization there. So it is apples to apples across institutions. And what I'll do is sending you a 40 page document to look at is probably not a very effective way to answer the question. We'll work on some summaries, a short summary with some supporting data and make it available to the entire board because it's some really interesting information 
it shows that we're doing some really, really good work in a lot of places that we've controlled administrative growth and some of those types of things that tend to be uh, problematic throughout higher education. So that'll be a good start that won't require you know, hundreds of hours of work to put together that I think that we can take that and then do other things from that data and information. But I just don't, I, I can send you the longer one, but I think what I want to do is maybe put a one page summary so you can get a quick synopsis and if people then want to dive into specifics that's all there for people to do. So I'll get, we'll get something on that out in the next couple of weeks in the board. Excellent, excellent. And then I did want to just comment on Purdue as well. I think we probably all have heard about Purdue. They're they're doing a lot of interesting, uh, you know, a little bit in your face, um, contrarian things, uh, including um, you know, sort of, I think refusing to be re refusing to let kids take out loans unless. The university also puts skin in the game for the repayment of those loans. Um, you know, sort of like a, we'll guarantee you you get a job to repay this loan, or or we'll repay it for you, or something like that. So I do think that the Purdue example is out there and is is something that you know may blow up in their face, but is something that bears um, study and and uh, um, and certainly will be on the minds of, of parents and students. And we should, we sh it's something that, you know, as regents, um, we should certainly be aware of and understand um, because if it works and is successful and, and truly holds down tuition, that would be a wonderful thing. Okay, uh, if there are follow-up questions, those are excellent comments, Regent Redmond. Um, I think we've got some good to-dos. I would suggest that um, feel free to, to reach out and let me know, let our president know um, if there is anything that you feel like you have questions before we are together again in May uh, to take action. But I have actually allowed us to go double the time in this agenda item. And so I probably need to move us along. I think the other ones are relatively um, quicker. But you're still. <laughs> we can do that. Let's do that then. That's a so, okay. if we might talk about future action item number two and number three together, they are closely related. This is for the services and activities fees at each campus. We sometimes call those SMA fees. Services and activity fees are fee assessed to every student, and those funds are allocated by students to support services and activities benefiting students. They are not to be used for academic or instructional purposes. So a reminder about the process, each campus has an SMAP committee with the majority of students on the committee. It's chair and led by students as well. Those committees do two things. They decide what rec, what rate of SNA fees to recommend to the board, and they hold hearings of different groups to prioritize and decide and recommend how those funds should be allocated to different groups on campus every year. As the committee student-led finishes their deliberations, they forward their rate recommendations to the chancellor, who forwards that recommendation to the president, and hopefully the system president's office forwards that here to the Board of Regents for consideration. Uh, those committees are currently meeting right now on each campus going through the deliberation process. They do a fabulous job of being so thoughtful and considerate about those funds. And those recommendations of both rate and the allocations will come forward to the board in May. For your, for your backup, if you're interested in the written agenda items, there, there is a 10-year history of service and activities rates by campus available for you, as well as a summary of the total SNA funds available to allocate over a five-year period in each campus. So that's two and three. All right. Questions You're on the roll. Okay. WSU Pullman Academic 2023-2024 Housing and Dining. Uh, so thank you, Matt. Appreciate you. Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, Dr. Ellen Taylor, and Assistant Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, Finance, and Thank you. Hello, and thank you. I'll try to be efficient. Um, You've got a timer, so. <laughs> yeah, it's blank. <laughs> oh, okay. So, cool. Well, then, yeah. All right. I'll be here tomorrow. <laughs> um, so, uh, 
Future action item number four, we talked about this. We brought this to you as an informational item in uh, January. This is the setting of the housing and dining rates for the Pullman campus. Uh, just as a little bit of a reminder, uh, the Pullman housing and dining system is a self-sustaining auxiliary that must uh, establish room and board rates sufficient to cover all operational costs, bond covenants, and to support the university's strategic goals and objectives. Um, and sort of as Matt just described, it's a very similar process. The advisory board, which is made up of 16 uh, individuals, uh, 11 of whom are students, have reviewed this, uh, this proposal for next year um, and are recommending it. Uh, another reminder, last year, the housing and dining system uh, engaged with a consultant who really did a deep dive uh, into our pricing structure and made some very uh, specific recommendations about how to review the pricing structure. So not just the prices themselves, but the way that we structure the prices. And really what you see in the documents that we've provided for you is the result of our evaluation subsequent to that consultant providing us with those, those recommendations. A couple of highlights about it are essentially what they were recommending is, well, where we went with their recommendations is developed what we're calling a tiered system. I wanna be a little clear here. We actually already have in some ways a tiered system. It's just not called that and it's not as transparent as what we believe we are moving to. So what we've done is go through all of the inventory identify based on amenities, uh, age, condition, et cetera, uh, identified each, each facility, putting it in a tier from one to four. Um, we may reevaluate that language at some point, but um, right now that's what we're calling it. And then within each hall, so if a hall is tier two, if you get a single room versus a double room, if you want a private bath versus a shared bath, that shifts the price up or down accordingly. A couple of other highlights. Equity was another consideration in this. You all know that we've been very concerned about addressing some of the equity issues in our housing and dining system, especially the housing facilities. The result of this restructuring, many of the housing options for students are going up a little bit. Some of the older and less desirable uh, options are actually going down in price relative to where they are now. So we're actually creating, I think, what is a more equitable system in the sense that if, it's hard to describe, but I think I know where I'm going. Um, the, some of the higher price points are going up a bit in cost and the lower price points are going down. So what we're doing is addressing what is in some ways, arguably a subsidization of the higher price point options by folks who are choosing the lower price point options or who have to choose the lower price point options because of their financial situation. Can you explain just um, how does the matching system work? So I'm a student, I happen to confirm, pay my, my confirmation fee, I'm right in the gate early and I, I want to be in Dunkin' Dunn. But maybe the next student is coming in and they're maybe now confirming and they're late in the party. They want Duncan done. How does the matching system work? Like what's your algorithm of how that all comes together? It's complicated because, and I'll say a little bit of, one is it used to be pretty much first come first serve. Right. The other thing that we ask students is, do you have, have you identified a preferred, like if they want a roommate, have you identified the roommate you want? And so, of course, we will always do our very best if two students say, yeah, we want to be roommates with each other. We will find a way to enable that. But it used to be much more first come, first serve. We are actually shifting a little bit to do a slower algorithm. One of the things that our data suggested is that first come, first serve actually tended to privilege students who are already coming from more privileged backgrounds. So not our first gen students from families who don't, you know, for whom this whole process is new, uh, not our low income students, not our students of color. So we've actually slowed down that process to get more of the requests in. There's a little bit of a, if you get in early, you're somewhat more likely to get your first choice, but we're not guaranteeing that until we get more more of the requests in so that we can do the best sort of shuffling around. This will, of course, require us to be very intentional. They are going in, we've got a website that students can go in and they say, this is what I want. They, they can check the amenities they want. Um, I think an important thing to know is 80% of our inventory lands in the lower tiers, the lower price point tiers 
of this model. So a student can go in and say, I want all the amenities and I want a private room and I want a private bath and I want all this stuff. And, they, and we have a few of those, <laughs> but we don't have a lot. And so the algorithm is in some ways still being developed for how we sort of allocate specific students to specific rooms, depending on what kinds of requests we get. They can go through and select what they want and there's filters built into the website. And then they can say, oh, that's not, no, I'm gonna take out, maybe I actually don't mind if I have a shared bath. Um, and that changes the options that are then in front of them. The early feedback is students love this process. Um, they love the sense of, I know what I'm getting, it's transparent, I know why I'm paying more or why I'm paying less. Um, I can, it, it, I feel more in charge of, of being able to, to sort of, and now that's early data and it's anecdotal, but we'll take uh, similar pricing structure being implemented with the, um, the apartments and the family and graduate uh, apartments. And I think that's all I, Linda, if I missed anything? I think, uh, no, thank you. <laughs> I think uh, what I, the only thing I would add to our conversation is the fact that we too do benchmarking, but it might not be to the same benchmark comparators that maybe the academic side does. So we, we do compare ourselves with Pac-12 and do a lot of study about how we price compared to the Pac-12. And I think the state of our inventory shows that we're generally uh, less expensive than other our peers in the Pac-12. Um, and you might hear that our, like I said, our inventory in those lower tiers is as, as nice as some of the other facilities in our Pac-12s. When the, our Pac-12 uh, comparisons, when the consultants, suggested that we take a deeper dive into the, the way we are pricing our housing and dining. Uh, they use more regional benchmarks. So they were looking at our students and they compared us, of course, the University of Washington, but also the state's regional universities, as well as the Idaho, uh, University of Idaho, Boise State, and the Montana schools. So those were really the main price uh, comparators that we used when we started looking at some of our amenities are underpriced. And as Ellen said, uh, we were sort of subsidizing some of our students were subsidizing some of those nicer options. So that's probably the only thing I would add in the fact that we are also very dependent on enrollment and occupancy. Um, and so we have to first and foremost, make sure that students want to live with us and we're excited when they come back to live with us a second year and we need to cover all of our costs of operations and meeting those deferred maintenance needs that we have. That's all I would add. Um, thanks for that and I guess I'm, I'm having a reaction to the word subsidize mm -hmm. and, and promulgating a culture where the students might capture that word and then start to use it inappropriately from the standpoint of structural, um, you know, equity. So um, I'm not sure if that's a, um, if there's an alternative word or, you know what I mean? I'm just feeling like, I don't wanna be one of those subsidized kids. And, and so it's a, it's a supply and demand pricing model that your products are being benched to, I guess mm -hmm. yes. that's, that's what yes. I think yes. you want to yeah, say. That's, yes. It's a different, yes, you know that's I mean? exactly yes. what we're saying. Where we've got so, so just uh, yeah. having been an RA in your system, <laughs> I just want to, the word gets out very quickly. And um, that's not the culture that we're trying to Absolutely. Um, promote, so. And in fact, I think this revised pricing model addresses that. Uh, and yes, you're right. That's, that's language we've heard as people looked at it and said, hey, wait a minute, this doesn't seem fair. We think this is a much fairer, more equitable model. And I, I'm gonna borrow that, or I'm gonna try to learn the exact phrase that you just used, but it's exactly right. It's really pricing what we're offering based on benchmarks based on amenities and, and empowering students to choose and being transparent in what they get for what right. they choose. And, and matching your supply and demand Absolutely. to the price. Yeah. So anyway, thanks for letting Yes, me. of course. Thank you, RA. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love that you were an RA. <laughs> That's awesome. 
just just some levity point of information. Most of us <laughs> go through our professional lives and you never cross paths with anyone who knew you as an awkward teenager. <laughs> but Miss McDermott and I knew each other. <laughs> back, in, back in our high school days. And it's been a real thrill for me to see you bring your <laughs> professional skills to the university. Like, yeah, but which one of you was the author? Yeah. <laughs> we clearly she was, know. She was a young, uh, was a young co-ed, and I was a big senior man. <laughs> and I don't have a red shirt on, but I so, feel like, okay, so, okay, well. So if you need any black family information. <laughs> you know who to call. She can provide it on you, I'm sure. <laughs> yes, I think that was, yeah, wait. Um, I, I really appreciate your comments, um, Regent Ramos. I think that was part of some of our previous pre-meeting conversations about how to ensure the housing was as equitable as possible and words matter. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I think the suggestions that you gave are, are really good. It feels to me, based on the conversations we've had, this is much more equitable. And so that feels like we're writing something that maybe we needed to. Yeah. So appreciate your leadership in, in this area. Okay, I'm gonna keep us moving. Um, the next up is the proposed student recreation center fee increase. I believe Matt maybe back up. We'll let Ellen speak to that. Okay, he's gonna come sit by me. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Linda. Uh, so we are bringing future action item five to you. This is um, a recommendation for a, a moderate, uh, modest increase, I'm using Matt's words, a modest increase in the student recreation fee that students pay on the Pullman campus. Um, as you all know, and as uh, we've seen earlier, the, the Rec University Recreation Center, the SRC as students call it, uh, or the rec um, is really one of the jewels on campus. It is it is a beautiful facility. I can tell you it's one of, and we don't get to say this about a lot of our facilities, this is one of the nicest ones in the region as a university rec center. And they've just done such a great job of maintaining it. The University Recreation Advisory Board, um, and actually I misspoke earlier, this is the one that consists of 16 voting seats, 11 of which are students. The Housing Advisory Board is still predominantly students, but I had my numbers wrong. Um, they uh, voted to, uh, to propose a, a small increase to this fee for next year. Uh, it really is about covering the cost of increase, increased costs of uh, staffing, uh, materials, uh, even replacing equipment and so on in the rec center, but also pay paying the many employees that work there, many of whom are student employees. Uh, the recent increases in uh, minimum wage have certainly had an impact on our recreation staff because they rely very heavily on our many minimum wage employees. So they are proposing a 2.44% increase, which is about four, which is $4 per semester uh, in the fee so it would go from uh, $164 a semester to $168 a semester. Is this for both undergrad and graduate? Is it I mean, mandatory for both of them? This one is to, for the SRC because all of those students have access to those facilities, yes. Also important to note, um, as we were chatting a little bit before, it's been flat for... Yeah five years, and that if you think about the, the rising minimum wage, and at 8.6%, that this is a pretty minimal increase. Yeah. I think that our director, and I could have this wrong, and many of you may know this, but minimum wage has actually increased something like 30% in the past, is it five years yeah, or 10 years, years or something? Yeah. But yes, the, the SRC fee has been flat for the last five years. So this is the first pro proposed increase in that law. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Great. Thank you for your time. Thank you. By the way, it's a two point game right now. Organs oh. up by two. Oh. At what time? 13 minutes left. Plenty of time. We we're down by like 16 at one point, 18 at one point. So, but I was not paying attention to that. That was, uh, that was <laughs> Regent Serna. I'm just going to say, who is not paying attention to my committee meeting right now? <laughs>
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, do believe, okay, right. I do believe we assigned the first part text. Didn't we tell him that was one of his responsibilities? Yeah, right, right. Student affairs. So that right. is yeah. supporting yeah. student affairs. As, as a region, I felt that is excellent. Track All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there you go. All right. Uh, up next, we're on. Um, Six uh, fiscal year 2024 undergraduate technology fee committee allocations. Yeah, perfect. And yeah, I thought we were working against a clock, but it turns out it was actually the game clock. Yeah. <laughs> 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 That's really great. It's Bring okay. it home, Matt. Bring it home for us. Do this yeah. before the end of the second half. Um, if we could, we combine six and seven. Yes, I was just going to ask. Um, these are both related to technology fees charged at the Pullman and Vancouver campus. Very similar process to the service and activities fee. Um, student leadership at the Pullman and Vancouver campuses have voted previously to create a technology fee to be used exclusively for technology resources that support general student use. Um, the committee made up of a majority of students and led by students, they do a similar process. They collect ideas and thoughts for what they should fund for general student computing or technology needs. They make a recommendation for those allocations of the fees to ASWSU at each campus. So there's a subtle there versus SMA fees. Um, at that point, ASWSU has two options. They can accept the recommendation. They could also choose to discontinue the fee at that point, which AS Division has not done previously, but they would have that option to do that. So after AS Division, if they approve the recommended allocations of technology fees, it would come to the campus chancellor and the system president for review and recommendation here to the board. So those technology fee committees are meeting at the Pullman and Vancouver campuses currently, and we'll have their information back to the board for me. Any questions about that? Again, want to uh, really express my appreciation, Matt, um, for all you have done. And so while we welcome uh, Leslie Bernelli, uh, we do want to, I personally want to thank you very much for your leadership um, during this interim time and, and throughout uh, the time that I have been involved in this finance committee. It's been excellent to work with you and uh, look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you, Matt. And with that, 25 minutes early. Oh my God. Uh, oh, I wow. turn the meeting back over to you. Such a good job. Look at that little white clock. It does yeah. magic wonders. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, and I know, I think I can speak for some of us who have gone into May, the May meeting around tuition increases. It's always a really difficult discussion, but I just, between last meeting and this meeting, feel so well prepared to go into May. And thank you for that. It really, it matters to be able to have some of this thoughtful dialogue. So very good. Um, okay, we, um, at this time, the committee meetings have actually concluded for the day. Um, the regents actually are going to go into executive session to discuss with legal counsel litigation or potential litigation in which the university is or could be a party of. Um, this session is closed. And so I think we will go immediately into that if you guys are okay with that without taking a break. Are you somebody okay with that? Um, so we will move into that, and then at the end of it, it will just give us a little time before we go on to um, our reception. Yeah. Um, okay, okay, so I'm setting up, I have a quick comment on the one of the information items. The amendments to the Senate bylaws that are listed under the manual—they're not.
All right, thank you, everybody. Um, we are reconvening um, our Board of Regent meeting uh, from our executive session that we just held, and we are officially adjourning. Our meeting will come back together tomorrow morning, and we will begin promptly at 8 a.m. Nine. Excuse me, at 9 a.m. Sorry, yep, here we go. Um, at 9 a.m., and uh, we will once again be live via YouTube and um, uh, streaming. So, thank you, everybody. Have a good night. We'll see you tomorrow. See you later.